So the goal for today is to talk briefly about, since we're talking about speciation and species and how populations diverge, to talk about us, since we're so hot. So the evolution of modern humans, how did we evolve? And of course, with one class period, there are so many things we could talk about, it's hard to cram it all in. So I'm going to try not to cram everything in, just focus on one particular concept that's key to evolution, which is the relationships between human populations. So that's the main objective, is to look at just one piece of data that suggests how we all are related to each other and how human races and populations are related to each other, and to look at patterns of migration with genetic information in a phylogenetic context. And that'll become clear what I mean in just a minute or two. So here's your first job. Straight off, 8 AM, Google Classroom assignment. You can do this by yourself if you want, or you can do it in a small group. It's up to you. So what I'm showing you here is a map of Africa, Europe, Asia, and the locations of a few different populations. We have current extant populations of humans. Those are the ones with the pins. San, the Yoruba, both of which are found in Central Africa, right? Yoruba, Burkina Faso, and Ghana, the San people in Southern Africa. Then we've got the French. Hopefully everybody knows where that is as well. We've got Han Chinese, a particular group of Chinese, and then the individuals from Papua New Guinea. And then we've got two non-human primates on here as well, the common chimp, Pan troglodytes, and the bonobo, which is also a pan species, different member of the same genus, okay, both of which are found in Africa. So your goal in the next five or so minutes is just make a blank screen on your tablet draw a phylogenetic tree that you think best represents the relationships of all of these individuals. Right, the Sanya, the Ruba, the French, the Han, the Papuan, Bonobos and chimpanzees, and lastly, how they're all related to Neanderthals, which aren't a currently existing species. There are no Neanderthals left. They're extinct. But I'm showing you where their range was. So outlined up here in purple is where fossils have been found of that ancient population of individuals, Neanderthals. Okay. So your phylogenetic tree should have eight different clades on it, Neanderthals and then these seven populations that are currently existing. So sketch one out, submit it to Google Classroom, and then in about five minutes or so, we'll take a look at your hypotheses about the relationships. Those. So we're going to come back and talk about the hypotheses you developed after we do a little bit more introduction about the relationships between these populations and what's happened in the past to humans. As I mentioned, we are, which is kind of strange to think about, in, at least in my opinion, we're the only member of the Homo genus on the planet, Homo sapiens. Right? There are no other Homo anything else in existence. We're the sole representative of our species, or of our genus. And this is a timeline of, which is in your textbook, of what happened to a lot of the other human lineages, ancient human, human lineages, and a smattering of samples of their skulls, fossils that have been recovered. And so it's kind of interesting, you can sort of see the evolution of at least brain size and skull shape over time from these various ancestors of ours. For example, look at Paranthropus, which is not necessarily a direct relative of ours. They branched off about three or four, between three and four million years ago into their own lineage, all of which representatives went extinct. So where do Neanderthals fall in here? How are we related to Neanderthals according to this graphic? There, so in this case, this tree suggests that Neanderthals are almost a sister taxon up here. 
not that we descended from Neanderthals, but that they were a separate group of humans that lived on the planet at the same time as some of our direct ancestors. Any questions about this? So this is all just from fossil evidence. You look back in time, you look at relationships between fossils found at different, from different ages, that is. So you can carbon date the fossils and find out approximately when these individuals lived. And that's how you get the timeline on the x-axis. So it's a hypothesis, one hypothesis about relationships between us and other human populations. There are two, especially specifically regarding the exercise you just worked on, there are two main hypotheses about how all of us modern humans came to be and the relationships between the populations. The one on the left is the multi-regional hypothesis. The one on the right is called the out-of-Africa hypothesis. How do they differ? What's the main difference between these two hypotheses? So the out-of-Africa hypothesis seems to have more speciation happening. So there's branching speciation, where at some point in time, a population of humans maybe left the population, split off, went somewhere else, went extinct. So it suggests there was a lot of that going on in the out-of-Africa hypothesis. Every once in a while, a group of humans left Africa, and they weren't usually successful until recently when modern humans about, according to the fossil record, about 100,000 years ago, left Africa, colonized basically the rest of the world. In which scenario are all of us more closely related to each other? In which phylogenetic tree, left or right, multi-regional or out of Africa, do we share a more uh, common ancestor more recently in time? B. Right, so B. Right, we've got all humans sharing a common ancestor pretty close to present in the out of Africa hypothesis. What's similar about both of these hypotheses? About the geographic origin of human populations? They both start in Africa. Sure, they both started in Africa. And that's what the fossil record tells us and remains we've found of individuals that look like what we expect ancient humans would have looked like. So the main differences are how long ago, right, was it two million years ago that our great, 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 great ancestors started leaving Africa? Or was it much more recently in time that the common ancestor of all hu current humans, Homo sapiens, left Africa? And we should be able to distinguish these two hypotheses. So what, what information would we need? These are hypotheses. What can we do to test these hypotheses? I guess you could see, Africa one, you could see uh, progression of transition moving outwards from Africa. So we would expect there to be differences in geographically between human populations? Yeah, so as one population moves out farther, you're going to see a transition in phenotype and in body style okay. as they move out farther. So one hypothesis is that, so of the human populations we looked at at the start of class, like the Papuan migrated the farthest from Africa, it seems like. So they might be the most distantly related or most different? Yeah. What information do we need to collect from humans to assess which of these hypotheses is more accurate? How do we tell how closely related we are to each other? What does a modern evolutionary biologist do? Collect what? OK, so look at genetic differences. So you go to currently existing human populations, and you collect. DNA, you sequence it, and you ask, yeah, how genetically similar are different humans from different populations? 
This is another way of looking at the out of Africa versus multi-regional hypotheses. I just added in some photographs of the extant human populations. I know they're too small to see. Maybe if you zoom in on your tablets. So there's the timeline running down the center here. From six million years ago, five, four, three, two, one million years ago, and then in hundreds of thousands of years, 900,000, 800,000, 700,000 years ago, up till present at the top. So I, I made this drawing to really explicitly try to compare the two hypotheses in terms of the timing. When you expect, given either of those hypotheses, when you expect certain events to happen. So the left side of the timeline is all out of Africa. And the right side is all the multi-regional hypothesis. We've got Africa represented here in the middle, and then the Eurasian populations on either side. So what's similar about both of these in terms of our ancient homo ancestors or sister tax of the Neanderthals? When did they leave Africa and colonize Europe? Yeah, about two million years ago. Right, Neanderthals, and that's the same in both of these hypotheses. We know this, again, because of fossil record geological dating of samples. The Neanderthals lived in what is currently Western and Eastern Europe. We know that they were there about two million years ago. The main difference on the tree is when the current human population circled in red shared a common ancestor, just like on the previous slide. So the out of Africa hypothesis suggests it was really recent in geological time scales that current human populations all migrated out of Africa versus the multi-regional hypothesis, which suggests it was a long time ago and that they we're all very much more different from each other, the right side, because we have to go way farther back in time to find the common ancestor of all of the current populations of humans. So I'm interested to see what your hypotheses that you drew and submitted are going to look like. So this is a summary, and this is one of the keys for the goals for today. What are the predictions of these two hypotheses? You either have all humans being equally related to each other, all currently existing human populations, or you don't. In the out of Africa hypothesis, it suggests that the African lineages are older. They were in Africa already, and that it was essentially modern humans that left Africa and colonized the rest of the globe. So here are the data. This is a phylogenetic tree done exactly the way it was suggested. Some scientists collected, in this case, it's mitochondrial DNA sequence from multiple individuals from multiple different currently existing populations, including representatives of African populations and Eurasian populations. There are some Native American populations on here, too. So here's a big phylogenetic tree of humans. What's interesting about this tree? What's notable regarding our history? Ultimately, the goal is to decide which of those hypotheses this phylogenetic tree, based on genetic data, is consistent with. Okay, so back in, so here are all of the African lineages down here in the bottom. Where do they share a common ancestor? Way back here, about 190,000 years ago. So all of the, and let's see, what else is on this tree besides humans? Chimps. Our outgroup, our sister species, chimps. Wait a sec, is there something wrong with this tree? What's wrong with this? Pardon? No. It's a minor issue, but. There's no root. OK, well, there's no root. We could root the tree. 
What's wrong with the chimps? They, like, it looks like they, got cut off. they went extinct, <laughs> right? About 70,000 years ago. That's not true. We still have chimpanzees. So that line should have really gone all the way to present. Other than that, though, right? So all of the modern existing human populations shared a common ancestor about 190,000 years ago. That's African populations <laughs> and currently non-African populations. What about the rest of the non-African populations? Are they equally related to each other or to or are all of us equally related? The status results that it's considered an odd group is because the others shared a common ancestor earlier, so it's like 83,000 years ago. Right, so the San represent, if you were talking about outgroups of humans, the San are the most genetically diverse. So they essentially represent the basal lineage, not that that's a bad thing, but most similar to the common ancestor of all humans, Homo sapiens, that is. What about the Europeans, the Asians, Pacific Islanders? When did everybody else share a common ancestor? Yeah, about 83,000 years ago. We've got, what, Australian, Chinese, Japanese, Siberian, Inuit, English, Crimean, Dutch, Georgian, Italian, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So basically every other non-African human population on the planet had a common ancestor about 83,000 years ago. So that suggested that what happened here? There was a group of individuals in Africa, right below the dotted line. There was one group of individuals in Africa. What happened? They, yeah, they left Africa. That one group migrated out of Africa, and then that group, individuals from that group spread eventually, of course, across the rest of the planet. That's what this phylogenetic tree suggests happened, based on DNA sequences from currently existing humans. So this is the out of Africa? Group? Right, so does this look more like out of Africa, or does this look more like multi-regional? What was, the, what was the main difference between the multi-regional and the out-of-Africa hypothesis? In multi-regional, they're all equally related. Right. So in the multi-regional hypothesis, every human population on the planet should be equally distantly related from each other, which would look something like a polytomy, where from a single common ancestor, every human population, the Song, the Papuan, the French, Etc. cetera, would derive. So this looks like the out of Africa hypothesis. Questions, concerns, clarifications needed? So where should we put Neanderthals on this tree? Wow. I heard a lot of very quiet. So they're not, they're more closely related to Homo sapiens than chimps. So presumably in there somewhere. So they diverge up here before all the human, modern human homo sapiens, that is, populations started to split. We've got non-human primates, chimpanzees, then we've got Neanderthals, then we've got modern humans, all of the rest of these individuals. And the really cool thing, which is you should be paying attention to, hopefully, Every once in a while, even in the popular media, newspaper, magazine, Scientific American, whatever, somebody has sequenced yet more DNA from Neanderthal bones, which is really hard to do. Because imagine you go find a fossil, you've got some bones in a cave in Siberia or something like that. You want to extract DNA from bones that are 100,000 years old, 
Well, first of all, the DNA is degraded over that period of time. So it's in tiny little chunks, like tiny little pieces. It's no longer long chromosomes anymore. So that presents one challenge. What's another real problem with doing DNA sequencing of ancient humans to figure out phylogeny? What's the biggest problem, do you think? I don't expect you necessarily to get this, but there's a real technical challenge. Who's doing the collecting of the samples? Horses? Chimpanzees? Who actually collects this material? Humans do. And so we grab the samples, and what they do is they use drills to drill little core samples out of the bones. They make dust, basically, bone dust, out of these fossils. And then they use techniques to extract the DNA. But absolutely. So all the while, my skin cells are falling off onto the bones and my hair. And so a big issue for doing any of this work has been how do you prevent modern human DNA from contaminating the samples that you're sequencing? And that was a technical challenge for years and years and decades. But then with clean rooms and with other technological advances, finally they were able to get clean samples to do this sort of sequencing so that we didn't wind up looking like everybody's related to modern humans of whatever population. But relatively re frequently now, people are finding new fossils, new Neanderthals, different populations around the world. They sequence them, and they're interested in... some questions. Not necessarily scientifically useful, but well, I don't know. I shouldn't, I shouldn't put my opinion on it. But. We're humans. It's interesting for us to know where did we come from? How are we related to each other? And did Neanderthals have sex with our great, 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 great grandmothers? So there's this common myth. Well, I don't know if it's a myth. We're going to see. There's this common story that red hair is a Neanderthal trait. It was originated in Neanderthals and was passed down. And if Neanderthals were a different species, Homo neanderthalensis versus Homo sapiens, what does this mean? Are those of us with red hair sort of hybrids between, I know it's just my sideburns, but, <laughs> and beard. Yeah, did, are, am I a product of a human Neanderthal hybridization event? Obviously, this is not the case, right? This is a non-heritable trait. I hope everybody <laughs> realizes that did not get passed down. So, this is, so one of the samples of DNA that, one of the earliest samples from Neanderthal bones, DNA samples, was sequenced I don't know, a decade or more ago. And one of the things they found, so this is from Science, the journal Science in 2007, up here. And one of the genes they were able to sequence from a Neanderthal bone was the melanocortin-1 receptor. And all you need to know about melanocortin-1 receptor is that it's involved in pigmentation. So it's one of the proteins that's involved in deposition of pigment in the body. And they noticed that compared to modern humans, there was one specific mutation that changed arginine at, pro at amino acid 307 to a glycine, right there. And they were curious what that did, what that one mutation would do, the pigmentation. So they created that mutation in a currently existing human cell line. So they wanted to know, in a modern human, if they had that mutation, what would that do? And it actually affects the production of pigment in these cells. So the hypothesis, supported by some laboratory work using modern human cells, suggested that if a Neanderthal had that mutation, that they might have produced less pigment. And that's part of this story about maybe red hair was a Neanderthal trait, that reduced pigmentation was perhaps something that Neanderthals evolved because they lived in a climate where you didn't need pigment to protect your DNA from ultraviolet radiation.
So that was really cool. They took an ancient mutation, they recreated it in modern humans, and they're now just trying to predict would that have caused a particular phenotype in those ancient Neanderthals. But there are two hypotheses. If I have red hair, do, does that mean that I had to get that mutation from a Neanderthal ancestor? No, it doesn't mean that maybe the environment that you're in kind of touches you similarly. Okay, so I'm of British ancestry, basically, and some Swedish, and all that Northern European, if you could tell, right? And so absolutely, so this could be, what do we call that in evolution, when the same trait evolves twice? Yeah, convergent evolution, parallel evolution. So these authors are careful to point out, right, that this doesn't necessarily mean that Neanderthals were having their way with Homo sapiens, or vice versa, that Homo sapiens were having their way with Neanderthals back in the day, that red hair could just be a parallel evolved trait. Neanderthals might have had it because they were in a particular environment, had particular selection pressures, and that modern Homo sapiens, the ancestors of modern Homo sapiens, we lived in the same environment and so evolved the same trait independently. But of course, the popular media loved this, the idea that you know, Neanderthals and humans, and so there has been, as I keep saying, there's been a lot of work recently trying to figure out, has there been gene flow, was there gene flow, between Neanderthals and Homo sapiens, way back in time, like forensics. At the very least, we know that modern humans, Homo sapiens and Homo neanderthalensis, did live in the same regions. So they were sympatric, right? Living at the same place at the same time. So there was at least some opportunity for interbreeding. Right? They were physically at the same place around the same time. And more recently than that, a different group of scientists collected some bones from these four sites shown on the map, did the exact same thing, extracted DNA, sequenced it, and wanted to know, was there any evidence of inbreeding between Neanderthals and humans? And that's, by the way, what Neanderthal bones look like. I would have mistaken them for branches, but that's probably I'm not an anthropologist <laughs> or a geologist. Hey, look, there's some branches in this cave. So they found that there are some human populations, and this is just a cartoon, I know, it's not showing the actual DNA sequence data, but their conclusion was there are some alleles, specific mutations from Neanderthals that were found in current human populations. Again, that doesn't mean that they're synapomorphies, that is, it's the same trait evolved, derived from a common ancestor, it could be independent evolution, it could be parallel evolution. But there were enough of them to make them suspect that there was some evidence that Neanderthal DNA might have moved into the Homo sapiens lineage. Most recently, about a month ago or so, there was a study of Y chromosomes. Looking at the Neanderthal Y chromosome versus human <coughs> Homo sapiens Y chromosomes, and they found that there, there's never been a modern human who's had his Y chromosome sequence that looks like the Neanderthal Y chromosome. So that was evidence against this idea. So if there ha ever had been some interbreeding, at least that means that no Neanderthal men passed their Y chromosome into hybrid Homo sapiens Neanderthal offspring. It doesn't rule out the idea that a Neanderthal woman didn't have some hybrid children because she wouldn't have passed a Y chromosome from Neanderthals into the human population. Would it be possible to test for mitochondrial DNA? Right, and so that's what has been the predominant source of DNA in these studies is mitochondrial. So this is really cool. Do you ever think about this? Y chromosomes pass from fathers to all their kids, their sons, and the sons pass their Y chromosome to their sons. So the Y chromosome only is in males ever. 
And that's one of the reasons that these sorts of studies rely on Y chromosomes. They have a single origin, and then they branch and branch and branch as one ancestor. You could call him Adam if you want to. Spread one Y chromosome across every human population. And then there's mitochondrial E, which is a term that somebody made up a while ago. Because mitochondria are genomes that are passed from mothers to all their kids, but it's only inherited from by the mother. So you get mother to daughter to daughter to daughter to daughter to daughter inheritance. So you get the Y chromosome on one hand, you've got the mitochondrial DNA on the other hand, and both of them tend to show the same pattern. Mitochondria are way easier to work with because they're much smaller pieces of DNA. Easier to get them out of these samples. There are lots more copies of mitochondria in our tissues than our nuclear chromosomes. So it makes them much easier to work with. So up to you to decide whether or not you think to weigh the evidence but I'd suggest paying attention to it. If you happen to see something in the New York Times or online, in one of those Facebook trending things, Neanderthal hybrids, click on it and take a look for yourself. So we've looked at the phylogeny of different human races. So mitochondrial DNA-based phylogeny. to look at the relationships between current homo sapiens populations. We use that to compare two hypotheses, the out-of-Africa hypothesis and the multi-regional hypothesis. And it seemed like the actual genetic phylogeny looked closer to the out of Africa hypothesis. Right, you all made your own hypotheses. We evaluated a few of them. And then we closed looking at signatures of whether or not we have Neanderthal DNA in modern humans. Some say yes, some say no. Given that we have a few minutes left, that's fine with me.